Uh, there's lots to discuss, so why don't we get on to it? Sure, good idea. And for our top story, the IPCC has made the starkest warning yet. Major climate changes are both inevitable and irreversible. In technology, uh, apparently Australia's federal court has ruled that an AI system can be named as an inventor. And if machines can be inventors, could AI soon monopolize technology? And what do you think the rights that an AI system should have? In materials, now we can use graphene foam to filter toxins from drinking water. Now in space, apparently SpaceX and a Canadian startup plan to launch a satellite that will beam adverts into space. And you can buy pixels on the satellite screen. In environment and agriculture, what could a meatless future mean for farmers? Because now the fungi renaissance is here and beyond burgers have competition. In biology, apparently microbes can reverse aging of the brain. In our human story, there's a small neurotech startup that has beaten Elon Musk's Neuralink for human studies. And so now with this, the brain wars apparently are on. And then for our health stuff, what's this about beige fat that apparently is indispensable in pro protecting the brain from dementia? So those are the things we're gonna be talking about. And now Richard, what's this in our top story from the IPCC that major climate changes are both inevitable and irreversible. Well, you know that I like to uh, have stories that are upbeat and positive, and it's hard for me to find a positive note to this story. Uh, the only thing I'm positive about with this story is that there is trouble ahead. And, uh, what they're saying in this report uh, is that human activity is changing the Earth's climate in ways that are unprecedented in thousands and hundreds of thousands of years with changes now that are inevitable and irreversible. And they're saying within the next two decades, temperatures are likely to rise far by more than the 1.5 C above pre-industrial levels. That is the Paris climate goal. And this will bring even greater widespread devastation and extreme weather. And the thing that is frightening that they're saying is the only way that we can prevent this climate breakdown is by rapid and drastic reduction in greenhouse gases this decade. And in my opinion, so far, the politicians don't seem to get this. And uh, in most places in the world, they are not reacting to the emergency that we are presently in. Now, in this climate study, they also found that human activity was, quote, unequivocal, the cause of rapid changes to the climate. And that uh, world leaders are saying that these findings must force new policy measures. We will see in the COP26 conference that happens on climate in November, if uh, this report has made any difference in the plans that countries around the world have. 
uh, the UN Secretary Antonio Guterres warned, quote, this report is a code red for humanity. The alarm bells are deafening and the evidence is irrefutable. And he calls for an end to new coal plants and to new fossil fuel exploration and development and says that governments and investors and businesses have to pour all their efforts into a low carbon future. And uh, let's see what else he says. Uh, I keep looking for something that is encouraging here. Maybe this is it. They say that stabilizing the client at uh, 1.5 C is still possible, but that leaving level of heating would still result in increasing heat waves and more intense storms and more serious droughts and floods like we have seen this year. Uh, they will, excuse me, I'm just letting Johannes in again. They say, if we can keep it to 1.5 C as bad as it is, it still is a much smaller risk than two degrees C. And even if we manage the limit warning to 1.5 C, there are some long-term impacts of warming that are already uh, happening that uh, are inevitable and irreversible. And these include uh, the sea level rising and the warming and acidification of the ocean. So uh, now this report is not the end of what we're gonna get from the IPCC. There'll be two reports that we get uh, next year. The first will focus on the impacts of the climate crisis. And the last one will detail the potential solutions. This report is bad enough that I wish they had to hurry up and get the last report out. Any comments? <clears throat> well, I would say that one of the big problems is that humanity typically is reactive rather than proactive. And if, if the climate scientists that get together in, the, in the Scotland there, in the end of this year, uh, unless they can really prove that uh, that something bad is inevitable and everyone can sense it, uh, nothing is going to happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd agree with that. And also, uh, the politicians are more concerned about staying on the right side of public opinion than they are of actually doing anything about this. So, but, and this is an alarming article, but perhaps it needs to be alarming. Yeah. It needs to be alarming to get people's attention, but uh, mm -hmm. there's still some flaws in it. Like when they show the temperature profiles over the last, uh, 2000 years, they failed to show the Roman warming period that lasted from you know 200 BC to 400 AD. And they failed to show the medieval warming period from 18 or from 900 to about 1300. And so that, that may be okay because they wanna get people's attention. And you notice all of the photos they use are of forest fires and all this sort of stuff. But the reality is, this is we're going to keep burning fossil fuels for the next 50 years um, because there's no other realistic alternatives. So it, the CO2 levels are going to get higher and things are going to get warmer and we need to figure out how to adapt. Mm -hmm. And the other real issue is we've 
we're painting ourselves into a corner with this huge population. It'll be 10 billion by 2050. And, um, and all these people in Africa and Asia wanna have middle-class lifestyles, which mean more consumption of energy. And yeah. you can't deny them that. So mm -hmm. it's inevitable. Yeah. No, there's no doubt that um, reducing the population has to be the long-term goal. But uh, then again, I mean, you know, kind of the African, imagine a politician in Africa, you know, he's not going to get elected. He's not going to get any support for supporting the uh, climate uh, climate moderation initiative you know well and the other issue is the aging population it's not so much that we need fewer people but we need younger people and that's what's happening in africa so that's a, a perhaps yeah. a good thing in africa yeah well again it's another argument in favor of soylent green <laughs> the only problem with Soylent Green is that, as I remember the book, at the age of 60, you had to go to what you can consider a recycling center. And I think pretty much all of us on this broadcast wouldn't be here. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, You're Rich, correct. In, in Canada during uh, uh, COVID, we did have a recycling uh, session. 80% uh, of the deaths in Canada were in nursing homes. Okay. Yeah. Let's hear it for COVID. <laughs> Very interesting. Mm -hmm. If now we want to move on to technology, apparently the Australia's federal court has ruled that an AI system can be named as an inventor. And says Richard, if machines can be inventors, could this soon monopolize technology? And what rights does an AI system have? Richard, tell us about it. There, uh, I think there are lots of interesting parts about this story, but uh, the just general background of the story in patent law, patent law is designed to protect the intellectual properties of inventors. And all of these laws were written, of course, thinking about inventors as human beings. And human beings take an inventive step, a new way of doing something that's not obvious to a person's skills in the same art. So that's the idea uh, behind patent laws all around the world. Uh, but last week in a first for any court uh, around the world, Australia's federal court ruled that an artificial intelligence system can be named as an inventor. And here, this uh, was uh, based on work of a US scientist, Stephen Thaler, who had developed an AI system that he calls DABUS, D-A-B-U-S, which means device for autonomous bootstrapping of unified sentiments, which is a pretty fancy name. And he says that DABUS independently designed a fractal shaped container for improved grip and heat transfer, and also an emergency beacon that flashes in a way that's more noticeably. And he can't take credit for these inventions because the AI developed them. And he files patent applications in 17 different countries. Uh, a number of them, like the US, UK, Germany, Europe, in Australia, the patent office had not approved these and their patent decisions waiting in another uh, 11 countries. And 
uh, one of the issues, it turns out, in patent law around the world is the idea that a patent is owned. And uh, most laws, systems, legal systems, restrict ownership to human beings. So uh, that's why most of these countries have denied his patent application. In Australia, though, the law is a little bit different, and it's different enough that the uh, courts finally ruled that while an AI system couldn't own the patent, it could be credited as the inventor of the patent. And in this case, the patent was owned by the guy who owned and created the AI system. And so uh, the issue also in some places like the English and Australian Patent Office uh, argue that their patent laws suggested an inventor needs to be human. So these are kind of limits uh, of the patent law with regard to AI, but uh, the Australia case and a week before it also in South Africa that has a different set of rules about patents, it, uh, the AI systems were uh, given uh, ownership of the patent or at least credit for being the inventor there are concerns, though, about accepting machines as inventors. And one of the concerns is an avalanche of automated patent generators that start to monopolize technology and that this would further entrench the dominant of uh, these big tech companies for whom AI is central. And they are people who are fighting this issue are saying the requirement for human inventors or human owners of the patents may be uh, what kind of like a firewall against the AIs taking over the patents. Uh, of uh, all the technology in the world. Certainly AIs can do it faster than the human researchers can. And to me, this still brings up uh, another kind of issue with AI is, uh, you know, when do AI systems or robotic systems start to be given legal rights as human beings? Uh, Saudi Arabia, I guess, already uh, granted uh, human being status to uh, one AI powered robot. And, uh, you know, what does this mean for being a human being and uh, being uh, a legal entity? If AI systems can be viewed as legal entities, then I really wonder uh, what does that mean? Does that mean if we're granting being legal entities to these other intelligences, uh, can a dog be a legal human being? You know, how about a chimpanzee or a bonobo? What are the limits? So those are the th issues that this brings up to my mind. What about you guys? Any thoughts? I thought that no. corporations always could hold patents, and they're not uh, people. Correct. But they can own stuff. Yeah. Yep. Well, if an employee comes up with something that's worth patenting, does the company who he's working for or does the employee um, uh, hold the patent? Depends on his agreement with the company. Some companies 
make the people who could be inventors uh, sign agreements so that any inventions they make are owned by the company, not the employer or mm -hmm. not the employee. They might give the guy credit, but the company is going to own it. So this one varies uh, company by company. Yeah, you know, my son, uh, my youngest son uh, has uh, about maybe six or so patents that you can find back in your cell phone. But uh, he worked at the time for uh, LG and uh, I think it is. Anyway, it was at Siemens and then it happened. Uh, and uh, they gave him 500 US dollars for each of these patents and a certificate. And that was it. And when I was in working uh, as a marketing director for Teledyne Semiconductor, uh, there was a product that we were going to make that we were patenting that I was listed as a co-inventor. I just would have gotten credit for being uh, having an invention, but I guarantee you they wouldn't have given me any money. Five hundred dollars. Yeah. I think. It I think an AI system should be treated the same as an employee. And, you know, if, uh, if, if there's an agreement that the uh, employee gets credit, well, then probably the AI system should get the money on the condition that they'll donate it to charity. <laughs> well, one of the, the real issue is... Uh, what are AI systems going to be allowed to do? And it'll be interesting to see if the, the lawyers allow them to represent people in court and argue legal cases uh, before a judge in court. And mm. I prosecutor and an AI defender and an AI judge <laughs> all uh, arguing these uh, legal cases. Now, there are already uh, substantial use of AI in the law, but these are guys that are doing legal research instead of arguing the cases. <laughs> well, the money will go to the company or, or it's a company is one guy. It will go there. But, uh... Well, it's interesting, too, the way the thoroughbred horse people have restricted the spread of thoroughbred horses by only mm -hmm. uh, I think we can't quite hear it, Andrew. Yeah. Right, well, he's, Andrew is muted, it says. Yep. Now, the one thing about the AI lawyer is I bet he could pass the bar exam. <laughs> I think, I think the first, go on. I think the first attempts at creating AI things will not be comprehensive. And if a lawyer is to go up against the AI system, he may be able to notice um, that the AI system has certain limitations that he could exploit. <laughs> well, I bet the human lawyer would be better working the jury than the AI system. Uh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> anyway, does the AI system uh, apply for the patent? Oh, I think the human applied for the patent and right. gave it. That's what I thought. You know, the AI system is really no, not much different than uh, a microscope in uh, medical research, for instance. You know, uh, without, without some of those uh, microscopes, uh, these very huge ones, you know, they, they have all kinds of discoveries. And... Uh, the, the, the credit doesn't go to the microscope, to the guy who's actually peering into it. Well, Richard, maybe if we should move on to space. And apparently, uh, SpaceX, the Canadian startup, are launching a satellite 
that will beam advertising into space. Uh, tell us about it. Now, so this is a Canadian startup and uh, Geometric Energy Corporation, GEC, and uh, using uh, SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket, they're going to launch a uh, CubeSat that uh, then will generate advertisements in orbit. And uh, it's not quite as cute as I had thought from the headline. What uh, they have is a cube satellite, of course, has six sides like a cube. And one of the sides of the satellite is essentially a, a high resolution computer screen. And uh, it will put your ad on the computer screen. And then they have a, a high tech orbiting selfie stick that is taking a video of your ad and then streaming the video via YouTube and things like this. So uh, you're getting your advert in space, but uh, what they're really seeing is something uh, in a YouTube video, maybe the selfie stick uh, shoots an area around your ad so you can see the ad is floating in space. I don't know. But uh, to me, another part of this that is interesting is the way you'll pay for your ad is you buy credits and you use Ethereum or soon Dogecoin payments to buy the ad. So you buy your ad in space uh, using cryptocurrency. And presently, they don't plan any limits on the ads that can be run because they figure it'll be expensive enough to keep uh, other uh, usages away that can't pay the money. Uh, but here it now, I don't know what uh, they would say in uh, Star Trek or something like that about launching your advertisement into space, but they're going to do it. And they say they'll send it up this year. And if you have enough money in your Dodge coins or Ethereum, you too can uh, run your ad in space. And we're all spaced out then, right? Yes. <laughs> well, the streaming channels are very good at not putting adverts on that people have not paid for. You know, you get kind of a section that just goes blank. So uh, I don't think this advertising company is, uh, is, is going to have a lot of success. <laughs> In this same article, there was a reference to another article that spoke of a company that would actually project up on the sky and they showed like a Coca-Cola sign that would be up on the sky. <laughs> yeah, it's not going to be the Coca-Cola sign up in the sky, I'm afraid. You have to get it on YouTube. I remember uh, sci-fi stories from the old days where I remember one where they had put a Pepsi logo on the face of the moon. But this is not that. Well, Richard, if we want to move on to our graphene story again, now it's going to be used to filter toxins out of our drinking water. Tell us about it. Well, it's uh, just another use for the miracle material. And, you know, there are some kinds of water pollutions like algae blooms and plastics that foil river that, uh, you know, you can see they're in plain sight. There are other pollution 
uh, that you can't see but are still quite dangerous, like heavy metal pollution. And so uh, what these guys worked on particularly was uranium. Uranium is, it turns out, in the water supplies in many places and at dangerous levels in many places. And the uranium can come from leaching into the water resources from mining operations or just from underwater aquifers that uh, have uranium. One of these is uh, in the US, there's are aquifers, including the plains and the Central Valley aquifers, which supplies drinking water to 6 million people that has high levels of uranium in it. And even small concentrations are bad for human health. And so what these guys do is they apply an electric charge to graphene oxide foam and the electric charge then uh, breaks down the water into hydrogen and oxygen and this uh, ends up reacting to the water that's around it and making changing its pH level and it changes the pH level enough so that uh, it starts to pull these uranium added to uh, ions out of solution and where they will uh, form some thing that kind of looks like fish scales on the surface of the foam. And uh, this is uh, simple, efficient and clean. Uh, the foam can absorb up to four times its weight in uranium, and it can be reused up to seven times. And to release the uranium from the foam, all you have to do is reverse the current, and then it just falls out. So it's easy to get it out. And uh, the this graphene foam also works just fine in seawater as well as fresh water. So it looks like it's a pretty universal solution. And the team that is behind this says that uh, what's going to come of this is a low cost uh, device that you can use as a new kind of home water filter to uh, clean up stuff coming out of your water that you can't uh, clean any other way, like heavy metals. They think they can modify the filters to be selective for other heavy metals, like lead and mercury and cadmium. And they see in the future that uh, we could have a smart filter that is powered by clean electricity that turns on the electrolytic action, which could extract multiple toxic metals from the water, and then also tell you when to regenerate the filter and give you a quality assurance report on the water that you're drinking. So this is yet another use of graphene and it's to clean heavy metals out of the water. The other approaches to this cleaning heavy model out of the water are much more expensive and much less effective. So this looks pretty cool. Yeah. Well, if you could make it specific to particular heavy metals, you could put something in the ocean to harvest the gold for the platinum that's already in the ocean. That's a good idea. Yeah. I it's wondered cool. a little bit about harvesting uranium. If you get too much uranium, could you uh, build yourself a water filter bomb? 
Well, the problem with uranium is you have to separate the U-235 from the U-238. Right. And, uh, that's the hard part. And it didn't sound like this was specific to different isotopes. Right. Uranium. They need further yeah. tuning. Yeah. More graphene usually will help. Yeah. I wonder, could a graphene filter work in a car, um, a car exhaust system? Interesting idea. Instead of a catalytic converter, good idea. Yeah. That's right. Because graphene is going to be a lot cheaper than platinum. <laughs> Maybe we'll hear about that next week. <laughs> so, Richard, what's this new uh, competition for Beyond Burgers with fungus? And what could a meatless future mean for farmers? What's that about? Well, let's go with the meatless future first. Uh, you know, a plant-based food system, of course, will be a big win for animals and for the environment. But uh, it looks like not such a big win for the farmers. And there are these new generations of meatless meat companies that are vocal in their ambitions to remake the food system. The Impossible Foods CEO says that he wants to end all animal farming by 2035. The Beyond Meat CEO says that he sees his company working to make this the first generation of humans to separate meat from animals. And so already these alternative proteins are starting to reduce the market share for meat and dairy products. And there are early signs of this shift uh, we see it a little bit with milk and all of the alternative kind of milk products that there are now. And now an Israeli startup it, that makes cell-based or lab-grown meat has opened up a pilot facility to produce 5,000 slaughter-free burgers a day and uh, the beef giant Cargill recently said that plant-based meat could make up as much as 10% of the meat market within a few years. But all of this is going to cause a massive shift in a big part of the economy all over the world, and one that uh, will lead to dislocation and upheaval for the hundreds of thousands of farmers and meatpacking workers. So they did some analysis and uh, surveyed a number of experts around the world uh, and found three types of peoples whose livelihood would be most vulnerable. The first group are farmers who grow soy and corn for animal feed. The second group are contract farmers who grow pork and poultry for big meat. And the third, of course, is meatpacking plant workers. And their position today is not unlike what coal workers and oil workers faced a couple of decades ago. They're in professions that uh, look like they are going to be going away or changing because of changes in technology. And there are, with these plant-based food, there are a number of things they're using now besides uh, soy and wheat. They're using peas and oats and mung beans and other legumes. And uh, 
with uh, these animal feed farmers, maybe they can go into alternate crops to be able to grow. Meatpacking workers, though, there uh, some of them will still be packing uh, the soy-based chicken nuggets in the packages, but uh, there'll be a lot fewer of them. And uh, a big impact is going to be on hog and chicken contract farmers. And some of them are already trying to transition their facilities into growing hemp and mushrooms. The problem with these contract farmers is typically uh, they don't have a big area of farmland like the ones who are growing corn and soybean. They have uh, buildings that are high-tech animal growing buildings where they grow their chickens or hogs in. And these buildings uh, cost hundreds of thousands of dollars, uh, which the farmers have to bring out loans to be able to pay for. Already, many of the farmers have trouble paying their loans. And so there is this enormous financial crunch that's going on already. And to change them into growing hemp or mushrooms is not an easy thing. They can grow them in, indoor in their building, but they've got to do a lot of retrofitting of the building. And that costs money and it's easy to uh, make mistakes when you're doing something that you don't know about doing. And, uh, you know, in the case of the uh, meat that is grown, a lot of the farmers who are involved in the meat industry really don't raise animals. They grow the soy and corn that are used to feed livestock. And right now, almost 40% of the corn crop goes to animal feeds and 70% of the soybeans are used for that purpose. And uh, for these farmers, the crops themselves actually are not that profitable, but they receive billions of dollars in federal uh, subsidies. All of that makes the corn and soy economy a difficult market to disrupt. And so, uh, still, what are these people going to do? The uh, markets for uh, things like peas and uh, these alternate products that they're using besides soy, none of those markets are uh, well established and stable yet. So for uh, the farmer to change from the corn and soy to a new crop is actually an enormous risk. And one of the things they don't know is how many farmers are willing to take that risk. The average farmer is older than the average population. And how many of these old guys are going to take the risk about changing their business? Also, for the people who are the chicken and hog growers, right now, they have a fairly easy deal. They have one product that they make. They know how to do that. They have one buyer for their product and they have an easy, secure world. And it's hard to convince them to uh, make the changes, to change their business model entirely and move away from the safe, secure thing that they know about into this unknown future. So uh, let's just stop here for a moment and ask, what do you guys think about the future of farms? Would you tell your kid to go be a farmer now? <laughs> Yeah. I think the principle needs to be established 
that through technology, there's going to be winners and losers. And I think something has to be done so that being a loser isn't so devastating. Uh huh. What's that, a guaranteed annual income? Could be. Well, they have this, they've had this SERP thing in Canada so that give, uh, businesses that are uh, impacted by COVID uh, are given money to, so that they won't go bankrupt. <laughs> it's the same principle. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, you can change the federal subsidies from soybeans and corn to mushrooms or fungi, as they call it, uh, mm -hmm. to slowly encourage, you know, if you pass right. some legislation that says next year, it'll be 2% less here and 2% more somewhere else, slowly you encourage the farmers to go in the direction that we need to go, because of course, uh, cattle produce a lot of pollution. Right. And uh, as we spoke of earlier, we have to reduce the man-made pollution that is uh, causing warming. Yep. And so this is another case where we have a transition that is coming and government action can either make the transition easier or more difficult. Yes, correct. And I wish I trust government to make it easier. <laughs> There's so many cases where big government is the answer except in the minds of the libertarians. <laughs> right, except when it has to do with getting your COVID shot. <laughs> yeah. Richard, if you don't trust government, are we about to trust microbes who apparently can reverse aging the brain? What's that well, about? we're almost ready to trust them, but first we need to talk about the fungi among us. So, uh, you know, beyond burgers and all of these guys who we were talking about in the previous article who are trying to make meat substitutes from plants, uh, there is a uh, new uh, approach that is getting ready to come. And it's one that is actually being very heavily supported by Silicon Valley venture capitalists. And uh, this is uh, turning fungi into protein. Now, this actually is not a new idea. In the mid 1960s, a British movie maker named J. Arthur Rank. Remember going to see movies that were J. Arthur Rank productions? <laughs> anyway, so he was, uh, he's a big wheat farmer and he was looking for a way to turn his excess wheat into production for human consumption. And he had his scientists analyze more than 3,000 different varieties of fungi and they identified uh, one uh, Fusarium vernacularum, which I'm sure I slaughtered the pronunciation, which grew easily in fermenters and uh, turned out a relatively flavorless hunk of high protein mycoprotein and he got this approved for sales for humans in 1985 and uh, started to make some products. And his first products, he didn't talk at all about uh, mycoprotein and fungi. Rather, he named his mycoprotein by a brand name, Quorn. Q-U-O-R-N, and corn really became a uh, kind of core vegetarian food, but didn't have much impact outside the vegetarians. And the company that made it didn't turn a profit until 1998, almost 20 years after it started in the business. But now 
there is a new wave of mycoprotein companies that are envisioning a much bigger future. future. And uh, for example, a Swedish company, Michael Rena, wants to be a supplier of ingredients to all the food companies that want to make vegan products. And they're going to provide technique technology and ingredients to companies that want to create their own non-meat products that doesn't have the expertise to create them in-house. And fermenting fungi has some big advantages over plant-based protein, uh, such as soy or pea protein. One of the advantages is the texture Mycoprotein has a meaty texture that uh, comes from these uh, fibers that are used. What's used for mycoprotein are not the mushrooms that grow on the top, but the fibrous stuff that normally we don't see that's under the ground. And that already has uh, the fiber that makes a meaty texture. To add that to uh, plant-based proteins, then they have to go through an extra step that's called extrusion. And it also, fermentation is potentially a very cost-effective way of growing uh, protein. All the fungi need is a source of sugar to grow on and they don't care where it came from. Some of the people are looking at uh, using crops that would otherwise be thrown away. And though they didn't say uh, the location, I suspect it's Singapore. Uh, they are uh, don't have much area to grow things. And it looks like uh, Singapore is investing in uh, micro pro mycoprotein production in a fairly big way and may end up being a uh, leader in that. They also are looking at different fungi. Another company found uh, an appropriate fungi growing in an acidic hot springs in Yellowstone Park. And this is nature FYND, Nature Fine. And uh, this is actually grown in uh, heated chambers stacked in shallow trays, which is a low footprint way of growing it. And he says this will make it particularly well suited for urban factories. Anyway, so the food revolution that we were talking about previously is about to get a lot more complex and it looks like uh, fungus will be uh, a new source of uh, food that helps feed the world and protect the environment. Any thoughts? Interesting. Now let's move on to the microbes. All right. What can microbes do about your aging brain? Well, we have heard that uh, as our population ages, one of the key challenges around the planet is to develop strategies to maintain healthy brain functions. And people have been looking a lot of different ways at uh, how to do that. And now one research team has uh, come up with a potentially new therapeutic avenue. And uh, what they have found is a uh, microbiome connection between uh, the stomach and the brain. And what they have found is transplanting microbes from young into old animals, then they could 
then rejuvenate aspects of the brain and immune system. This is another case for, I guess, fecal transplants, but here you have to have the transplant from a person with a young brain into somebody like us with old brains. <laughs> and so uh, it's interesting that they're finding out that the gut microbiome plays a key role in the aging and aging process. And uh, they have established that the microbiome can be harnessed to reverse age-related brain deterioration. They also see evidence of improved learning ability and cognitive function. So there's a lot of positive things here. They are not saying necessarily that we all should go out and get fecal transplants to rejuvenate our brain. Uh, what they really are looking to do is to uh, understand what is going on here and then maybe be able to find a way to harness this in the other ways. And it opens up possibilities in the future to, for us to be able to modulate our microbiome and be able to improve our brain health. Any thoughts? Well, it should be an easy sell because we're all hardwired to like new shit better than old shit. <laughs> so, uh, so it's not eat good. shit and die, it's eat shit and live. Yeah, That's right. Get, That's right. And get younger. There and, was a thing, thing on uh, PBS last night about aging and reversing aging. And there's something called the naked mole rat that yes. lives... 40 times as long as any other rodent. Yes. And they've taken the biome from its gut and it's remarkably similar to the same biome they find in the guts of 100 year old Japanese people. So, okay. And so they think that uh, that's a clue, a further clue to the- problem. Okay, so we need to get naked mole red fecal transplants. Apparently. Okay, I guess I'm ready. As long as uh, I would do it if I take a pill, I'm not sure I would do it in mm. its raw form. <laughs> <laughs> well, Richard, if you don't want to use microbes, how about a startup, Neurotech, that can do things with the brain and even beat Elon Musk in doing this can computer brain thing. Tell us about it. Well, it's actually uh, another story for their interesting parts. And uh, it starts with last week, the FDA granted this neurotech startup Synch Synchron uh, with approval to conduct more ambitious experiments and test its neural implants in human paralysis patients. And that actually puts them ahead of Elon Musk's Neuralink, which has had a ton of financing, $360 million, and is doing an enormous amount of research but Neuralink has yet to convince the FDA that it's ready to make the jump from technical demonstrations in animals to actual human beings. So they got FDA approval and Elon Musk's Neuralink has not gotten that FDA approval yet. And so what Synchron is doing, uh, there are different twist is uh, they are inserting stents into your jugular vein and from there into the vessels that surround the brain and supply it with oxygen. And so they're permanently implanting 
a distributed series of sensors that constantly record your entire brain's activity. And they think that this will end up allowing doctors to treat conditions ranging from Parkinson's to paralysis by allowing the brain to seamlessly communicate with computers. And they rely, I think the reason they got the faster FDA approval is they rely on the same techniques that have been well proven in heart procedures, the stents, but they uh, have not been used in uh, brain treatment yet, except for strokes. And the uh, developer of this thinks that uh, this is a real hot area for investors. Investors see that uh, this technology is going to create new industries in the medical area. And so at this point, they're all wanting to get in on the ground floor. And the developer says that the ultimate goal is whole brain data transfer. That kind of scares me is the name. And the ultimate end game for the technology is to have bi-directional data flow in all regions of the brain and they think the blood vessels are the best way to achieve that and they're working on smaller stents that can get into smaller blood vessels so that they can uh put all of these things in your uh brain and they think while they are competitors with Neuralink, they think that their brain computer interface is such a different approach that their uh, patients will like a lot better because they don't have to have their skull removed. I don't think I want my skull removed. And they think it's a different experience for patients and so they see themselves as offering a minimally invasive solution for all brain interface technology applications. And their uh, flagship, what they're using to develop this and delete it is working with paralyzed patients, of course, because uh, people are willing to use paralyzed people as experimental subjects. And uh, they are particularly working with people, patients who are not able to move at all. If a patient can't move, it means they can't control uh, a digital world. And so what they're trying to be able to do is to digitize a person's intent so that they can then use that signal to be able to uh, control robotic limbs and those kind of things. And uh, it looks like a fairly exciting thing and it's a very different kind of approach that Neuralink takes. The Neuralink approach is we'll put all these sensors in your brain. Uh, the way we'll get them there is we design this special robot that can drill holes in your brain and insert the sensors in it. And I'm not sure if I want that process myself. Maybe you guys do. What do you think about this? Any thoughts? Well, having six cents in me, I know the procedure for the coronary arteries, and uh, it is painful, and there is just no, uh, you know, no, no side effects. So, if uh, if you if you can put uh, a stent in the coronary artery, uh, I think that uh, I mean it's the same technology, you know, improvement or for. I don't know how many years, and uh, it works. Yes. Well, 
they say skull, you know, by the way, they're talking about laser uh, surgery, which means that quickly blast away uh, from your skull to drill a hole. Well, the procedures of inserting stents is now quite sophisticated. It's been done for many, many years. Both Norman and I have stents. I got my stent last month after a heart attack. My uh, left uh, artery, descending artery, so le left anyway, uh, became completely blocked, 100% occlusion. And uh, so they put in a, a quite a long stent apparently. And, and uh, my wife is a, a nurse in cardiac intervention where they do this. They, they, you know, push a device up through your arteries and they're able to do surgery, uh, clear blockages and fix heart valves and all sorts of things. So that's already, you know, pretty sophisticated. They, they have a lot of experience. So yes. I can imagine that putting a stent in to your jugular to get up into your brain makes a lot of sense. I don't want to have so many holes drilled in my skull. Thank you very much. Right. <laughs> I thought I said the same thing. I, I've got stents and they are easy, uh, they are easier to put up with when they put in the main than a root canal. I mean, I'd sooner have a stent than a root canal any day. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Uh -huh. I also have a stent and, uh, you know, it was uh, a fairly easy process and uh, after it, immediately after it, I felt the difference. Mm -hmm. I bet you did too, Keaton. Oh, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And another Recovered good completely. About about these uh, stents is because it's intravascular, it doesn't compromise the blood-brain barrier like uh, the um, uh, Elon Musk surgery would, where yes. you're putting needles. Yes, that's actually a, that's a good point. So there's less chance of infection and all the other complications of mm -hmm. introducing foreign things into your brain. Mm -hmm. So I think this may be the case where Elon Musk loses a technical race. <laughs> <laughs> so, Richard, um, if instead of, uh, of using some kind of stent, you want instead to have fat, what is beige fat that can protect your brain maybe just as much as stents? What's that all about? Well, I had never heard about beige fat uh, until I read this article. I'd heard about brown fat and white fat, and white fat is not good, and brown fat is good, and I didn't know anything more than that. And it turns beige fat is kind of in between brown fat and white fat, and they find that beige fat uh, brings down inflammation associated uh, in the brain and in the body. And inflammation is also comes, the more white fat you have, the more uh, inflammation you have. And it also turns out the more white fat dominates your metabolism, then the risk of dementia <laughs> is very much higher. And so they are now saying that beige fat cells are, quote, indispensable to the neuroprotective and anti-inflammatory effects of the subcutaneous fat. And uh, to get more beige fat, they say, uh, what brings it about is exercise and exposure to cold. 
So I don't know if any of us live in, oh, hey, we have Andrew and Clive. Those Canadians live in places where it's cold. So you should <laughs> just turn the thermostat down and turn your beige fat up. And uh, as they are exploring it, uh, they're saying, if we can figure out what it is about beige fat that limits the inflammation, then maybe, uh, and also figure out what it is about beige fat that improves brain plasticity, then maybe they can mimic that effect with a drug. And so we know if they uh, have the potential of developing drugs that they can sell, that they're going to be doing a lot of research in it. And, you know, they have found in this research, they've found a lot of damage with high fat diets. And one of the things that to me sounds the most frightening is they found that a high fat diet prompts microglia, which are a kind of brain cell, to become uncharacteristically sedentary and to start eating the connections between neurons. It may be that that's why uh, too much uh, white fat contributes to dementia. And so again, evidence suggests that we can uh, increase brown and beige fat by exposing ourselves uh, to cooler and cold temperature and by uh, intense exercise. So I don't know, do you want intense exercise or to buy the new pill? <laughs> Any thoughts? Well, that may be why these naked mole rats do so well. They're cold all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Richard, for the last year or so, whenever I have a shower, at the end of it, for, oh, half a minute or a minute, I told, uh, put it on completely cold. Uh, and I've done that because I've read that uh, cold showers and so on are quite useful for getting brown fat. And, but I'd never heard of beige fat before. Well, maybe you're helping your beige fat too. Could be. <laughs> also, I mean, well, the other good reason to run cold water at the end of your shower is to close your pores. Yeah. It's also no, really. take a shower without clothes on. <laughs> <laughs> Elsewhere in the article, it referred to uh, pear-shaped individuals as opposed to apple. Yes. Shaped. <laughs> so abdominal fat, it turns out, is much worse than having right. a fat ass. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Put it in layman's terms. All right. Thanks so much, Richard. Uh, nice discussion. Uh, thanks to everybody else for participating. And once again, we'll see you next week. Bye for now. Okay. Thanks, Fred. Thanks, Fred. Yeah, Thank thanks, you, Fred. Fred. Thank you, Richard. Thanks, Richard. Adios. Good to see you all. And good session. And we'll see you next week. Okay. Bye.